sorry for the slightly late start. We have some complicated material to discuss today. It may result in me uh, stopping and starting the recording at various times. I see that there's only one person out there anyway. I again apologize to you if I have to stop or start. It's very, very important. And I'm challenged by being able to use the pen tablet and trying to take pictures of what I draw by hand and making sure they display correctly. So I spend way too much time on that. Believe it or not, I spent uh, something like uh, 20 minutes just drawing this simple, simple picture. But I want to pick up on uh, bond convexity and duration. And the graph I showed last time started as this, but really on page 151, if you want to show it more accurately, this picture does show the way bonds are usually shown on a graph. It shows, obviously, if the yield goes up or interest rates go up, the bond price comes down. If interest rates go down, the bond price goes up. And that curvature there shows convexity, but it's the slope of that curve is not quite equal to duration. In order to make the slope of the curve actually equal to duration, you would have to draw it as change in B over B. I said this last time, but I hadn't written it on the scribble. Um, so this is the percentage change in the bond price and the change in the yield. And here you can draw a, a tangent line and see that at zero change in yield, that there is no change in the bond price and that these two bonds have the same duration. But that duration only applies to infinitesimal changes in the um, interest rate. So as we see, as you move away from there, okay, your duration actually changes. And again, convexity is this beneficial uh, anomaly, I guess you could call it, in which it works nicely for you. Because as interest rates go down and bond prices go up, the duration goes up and you automatically get an extra little kicker because you want the interest rates to go down so it actually gets better and on the downside if interest rates go up okay then you see of course the bonds losing value but over time as that price goes down or uh, over here, we're moving down over here, the yield has gone up, the price has gone down. That's somewhat mitigated by the fact that duration gets lower so that those interest rate impacts are smaller on the bond percentage changes in pricing. And again, you see the difference in convexity between these two curves. This bond A is better than bond B in terms of convexity, yet it has the same duration because it shows you for non-infinitesimal changes in this. And when you get greater than that, it benefits more in general from the interest rate decline and gets hurt less from this gap here. It hurts less by an interest rate rise. So let's just go back to that in the presentation. What I'll just point out in passing to really capture this relationship, this is happening in continuous time and therefore should really be expressed in continuous time, which means you take the log. But I'm not going to go into the math of that, but technically, to be more accurate, the vertical axis is the log of the and the horizontal axis is the log of 1 plus y. But that's all in the math and not something you're responsible for. So this shows us the duration relationship, which, as I said, is the slope of that line in figure number two. 
This is shown on one of your pages, um, as I'll say later. Um, I put it on this. I thought I put it right on there. Page 151 was that. I've also loaded it to content. But if you go to your book, the elegant graph of that is shown on page 151. So you can resort to that and see convexity. So here's the basic relationship again. Then it shows, again, the next step, which was the modified duration, which you're not responsible for. Again, using logs, this it tends to approximate this more closely. And then the bond relationship is the weighted average of the constituent bonds in there. All right. And that's, again, just the weighted average, so it's really pretty easy. Um, Ultimately, in order to remove all risk, and we'll talk about this when we deal with the term structure of interest rates, explaining why the yield curve looks like it is and does, is that you really want to define risk as a mismatching between your duration and of your assets and the duration of your liabilities. And we'll see this is especially important for a defined benefit pension plan, which has, which I notice uh, I'm eligible for the Texas retirement system, is a defined benefit uh, program that, as opposed to a defined contribution like 401ks, and uh, that promises a certain payment per month after retirement. It's sort of like an annuity. Um, so what does the assets have to do if you really want to match those liabilities and be guarded against interest rate changes at least on the barn segment of your portfolio you want to again have the duration of the assets equal to the duration of the portfolio of liabilities that's what a pension fund is trying to do but an individual in theory as we're going to see is trying to do essentially the same thing and that helps explain the theories that we're going to talk about as we saw last time, and this is where we left off last time, the convexity always helps. Again, you're not responsible for deriving it, but it's the second derivative of the bond change in pricing uh, relative to this uh, to the um, change in the yield, and that's a certain formula. And you see how it works in in actually calculating for more than infinitesimal changes for how the yield changes and how it impacts the percentage change in the bond price. And so you see the convexity in here, as I said before, this is part of a Taylor series expansion, which attempts to measure movements along a curve. You can see that convexity always helps. So if yields go up, pushing bond prices down a certain percent, they don't go down as much because of the convexity factor. And if interest rates go down, causing bond prices to go up, duration underestimates that because you have to add on the little convexity, the curvature, we saw that on our graphs. So convexity is always good and the more convexity you have, the better. Um, what all this stuff is assuming in terms of duration uh, movements on the bond price, is it's assuming parallel shifts in the yield curve. Otherwise, it becomes a much more complicated relationship. Um, again, it could technically be handled by hand, but uh, it's a much more complicated, not as easy of a relationship. All right, theories of the term structure. Again, this is pretty much where we left off. The expectations process says that the expected future spot rates are, are, are equal to the forward rate. Okay, remember the expectations hypothesis gives you expected future zero rates actually being realized equal to the forward rate calculation that you could have done in advance. Remember how we bootstrap 
in order to find forward rates. And again, in the situation where the expectation theory is correct, which means that people are essentially risk neutral or the marginal investor is risk neutral. And if that's the case, they're not worried, as we'll see later, by something such as interest rate risk. And again, a rollover strategy of one-year T-bills should give you the same amount of money after 30 years as does a buying straight out 30-year strip. Again, that's assuming reinvestment of T-bills into the next T-bill. Nobody tends to believe this. We tend to believe that that yield curve, especially as you move to longer zeros, that that yield curve has to compensate for the additional risk, and we'll see why momentarily. And that means that, again, think about it. I might have a graph somewhere, but uh, I didn't put it down. That means that the yield curve is sloping up more in theory when you add that risk premium to it. So again, longer term rates get on top of the expected future spot rates summing to the value in year 30, the 30 year also gets a risk premium on top of that. So what does that mean? It means again, that you get a little extra money or maybe a lot more extra money in theory, okay? If there is a risk premium for the longer maturities, you get more money from a 30 year zero strategy than a rollover of one year. What that basically means is that when you calculate the forward from the zero curve, and I understand this is confusing, especially without a board, but when you calculate the zeros from the yield curve and plot that yield curve and you calculate the forwards, each of those forwards is imputing some sort of small risk premium. Okay, again, that's expected future spots, meaning that, the, yes. No, that's not there. Um, I don't know if that was a question. So again, you could draw it, and again, the easiest thing to do is take the world with expectations theory and simply draw a yield curve. Okay, you can draw it flat if you want to. If I had my pen tablet handy and wanted to take a chance of using it, I would write it. But then you can draw a flat yield curve, and that could be under expectations theory where expected future spot rates are not only equal to each other, but that the expected future spot rates are equal to the zero rates. Then you can assume the liquidity preference hypothesis. And the liquidity preference hypothesis, then you're going to assume there is a risk premium. And the higher or the longer the maturity on the zero, the more it's going to give you of a risk premium. And so that means, again, in theory, if you were to calculate this out, that the expected future spot rates are actually lower than the forward rate you're calculating. Because if you roll over the one-year T-bills, you're not getting any risk premium. There is no effective interest rate risk on that and so you're not getting it again maybe i'll lead off next time with a little bit of a graph but hopefully if you draw a yield curve that is just flat and assume that's expectations theory but again expectations theory won't give you a flat yield curve unless expected future spot rates are expected to remain the same as the current spot rate but let's just assume it is again even if expected future spot rates are anticipated to be equal to current spot rates again that 30 year zero is going to have to pay more than the average of those now in terms of that again this comes into the guise of liquidity preference uh, theory 
And so let's talk a little bit more about the liquidity preference theory. Okay, it basically says, as I said, there's a risk premium. The way it's easily summarized is that people have a preference for liquidity. People have a preference for liquidity. Therefore, they, all other things constant, are scared or don't want to go out longer on the yield curve. Therefore, to induce them to go out longer on the yield curve, as opposed to staying liquid, staying liquid means being in short-term securities, which are very close to cash. The closer to cash it is, the more it is liquid. And again, a one-year T-bill, let's even take a three-year T-bill, a three-month T-bill rather, in three months, you're going to get your money back and you'll have it available to spend. So liquidity preference hypothesis is saying people prefer to remain liquid. And why is that, though? They prefer to remain liquid in general because they too, and this is not said in the book, are trying to match the duration of their assets with the duration of their liabilities. Most of people's assets, okay, are structured in order to handle the liabilities. And most liabilities are sooner versus later. Americans save between about three or to 6%, usually, sometimes it goes up to 8 but it, uh, it's not very high, about 3 to 6% of their income. That means between taxes, which they have to make the tax payments, and consumption, they're basically spending the other, let's just call it 95% on one expense or another. Again, keeping, again, that includes the taxes and keeping the savings rate at about 5%. Again, a simple, simple assumption. And the reason they stay liquid here is to meet all those immediate expenses like the rent and the car payment, but mostly the groceries, things like that. Again, the rent payment and whatnot. So they prefer to stay liquid. And, but the reason is that most of their liabilities are short term. They have other liabilities such as retirement that is long term. And that may be a reason to use higher duration assets to meet them. But let me just give an example of this that shows you that saving for retirement with a fixed income long-term instrument or saving, let's say, for college that you anticipate for a child in 15 years with a long-term, let's say, zero-rate bond may not be the best strategy. And that's because most long-run liabilities are variable. They're not fixed. Now, this is a little technical point that you're not responsible for. I just would like to lay waste to the idea that if you have retirement and you have college payments to make 15 years from now, either of those two situations, that the, quote, safest strategy is to simply buy the long-term zero because that may make you think that boy people don't mind lending long term in fact the biggest thing that's going to determine relative to now how much it's going to cost you in retirement or how much it's going to cost for a college education is the intervening inflation in all these years and if the long-term bond has not properly incorporated the actual inflation that's realized, you'll lose out terribly. So imagine that you've got a bond that over, let's say 15 years, okay, gives you uh, double your money is a little bit much, but we'll just say you double your money in 15 years. 
That's the power of compounding. Um, what happens if inflation turned out to be um, much more than that? It doubled in 15 years. But in general, if the inflation rate is higher than what you're collecting, and it may turn out that way, then your real purchasing power is actually going down. And if there's lots of inflation with your fixed income investments, it may not be sufficient to pay that off. Uh, excuse me, there's the phone and I got to let it ring. It's the chairman of the department. Um, let me stop this. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to answer the phone, but I just want to stop it for the benefit of those. It'll, it'll just take a second for the, to stop ringing. All right, I'm back. The phone stopped ringing. I pretty much had stopped ringing by the time I closed it. I'm so busy talking about closing it. So again, are you going to be tested on this? You should be understanding the basics of the term structure, the liquidity preference theory leading to a risk premium that gets bigger as time goes out and causes those forward rates of interest to capture parts of those risk premium and therefore to overstate what you actually expect to get on a one-year T-bill, let's say 29 years from now, a one-year T-bill 29 years from now, because that doesn't have to pay any risk premium, yet the forward rate for that year captured that. All right, here's liquidity preference theory and an example. Um, I don't really like the way the book presents it, so I'll make quick work of this. And it basically says what happens if a depositor is offered 3% and 3%. Again, they have liquidity preference, and the outlook for rates is flat. And what you can see is the five-year is not paying that risk premium. Moving out to five years may cause some mismatch between the duration of their assets and the duration of their liabilities. And therefore, you will not accept 3% if you're expecting a flat yield curve. Therefore, that yield has to be higher. I should mention in passing, that stocks are generally a good investment for retirement and also for saving for college education, provided it's far enough along, because over time, at least, stocks do tend to compensate for inflation. And it's because of what happens to profits when price goes up. Um, I might have mentioned this, this class or some other class. I've got too many to deal with. and uh, But basically... You can notice if prices double and costs double for a firm in simplicity, profits double. So the prices you pay are something that's being received by a corporation. So whatever inflation might occur in the economy, that tends to be part and parcel with prices of consumer goods and whatnot and investment goods going up by a like amount and those prices are realized by uh, producers. Now the mortgage rate, and again, uh, they use a particular example over here. They use the term reinvestment risk. I don't like that term for the exact reason I just gave before on the liquidity preference hypothesis, that since most of your liabilities, at least for a consumer, are long-term variable, the most variable component being inflation, that again, the long-term strip, unlike the stock, the long-term strip or zero coupon is not the safest way to save for it. Instead, if inflation rears its ugly head and you're worried about that, that's risk. If inflation rears its ugly head, then you'd be better off with one-year bills because they reset 
every year to account for the inflation. So is that reinvestment risk? No, it's actually reinvestment lack of risk. So I just simply don't like this reinvestment. Instead, I prefer you look at duration of assets versus duration of liabilities as defining why there's a liquidity preference hypothesis and a risk premium being paid. Now, 6% versus 6%, this is the bank making this loan here. This is the bank making this loan to you. And it actually wants to stay liquid in general as well. Now, again, banks in general borrow short and lend long, but almost the, a very large portion of the bank's liabilities are short term. It's depositors, people with checking and savings accounts with the bank, and that's short term. So they would want to match their assets with the duration of their liabilities, which means that basically 6% is not enough for the risk of a five year. A better example, if you use a 30 year mortgage instead of a five year mortgage, you can see this more pronounced, but you can see since you're relying on funding mostly from short term deposits, that means that unless you're induced to do otherwise, you do not want to loan for five years at 6%, which just leads to the next one and says under liquidity preference hypothesis, if the prospects for expected future interest rates are flat, you'll get a higher than 3% rate, a risk premium being paid to the depositor, all right? And you have the mortgage company charging essentially an extra amount okay for its risk of mismatching assets with liabilities all right that i think finishes this chapter again i'm not going to test on that much of it but you basically ought to know the essentials of risk premium again calculating the expected future spot rates from forward rates if liquidity preference is right would mean, in theory, deducting something from the forward rate to get the expected future spot. We don't know how much that is. Okay, since expected future spot rates are not observable, we actually don't know how much that is. But we can intuit that there is one there and it gets bigger as you move further out on the yield curve. All right. We move into chapter five. Oh, I, let, I labeled this rest of chapter five and some of six. I have to change that. It's really rest of chapter four and some of five. I was hoping to get to all of five. Oh, okay. I see there's three people here. Um, okay. That's good. Um, consumption versus investment assets. Um, a distinction which I don't like to make too much, but again, it's terminology. Investment assets are held by significant numbers of people purely for investment purposes. I mean, they're not holding it for fun. They're holding as investment. And that means that a lot of people own it and have it available for something such as selling. If you wanted to sell it in a hurry, you would have it available. We'll see the role of this momentarily. Consumption assets are assets held primarily for consumption, copper and oil. There's not people just sitting on these amounts for investment purposes, even though I take exception to a little bit of that. But usually when you would want to invest in copper and oil, you either buy the stocks of such companies or you can buy 
futures contracts on copper and oil. And usually the people are making shorter term bets as you try to get further and further out on the futures curve, what's called the futures curve, the, f- the futures price over time, you'll see that you get much, much less liquid futures contracts. And liquid there means differences between bid and ask spreads. In other words, the spreads are big. Most of the active trading in futures occur in, let's say, out the next six months to a year, sometimes even shorter than that for a lot of people. They give an example of short selling, which I don't want to make too much of here. Short selling involves selling securities you do not own. Hopefully, we discuss that somewhere or another. But basically, what you do is you go to your broker or you put an order right away online, since that's how most people do it these days, and you put in an issue to short sell. In most cases, the shares are available at the broker. The broker basically has other customers, and some of those other customers ultimately are going to own those shares. So basically, what the broker is doing is it's allowing you to borrow from the other account. It borrows out of another client's account. And then you are able to give those shares and you sell them into the market in a usual way, as you would sell anything in the market. So that is essentially a short sale, and we'll see some uh, implications of that uh, soon. Now, if your order winds up getting canceled, your order to short sell gets canceled, it means because there are no shares available. At some stage for the short sell, you have to buy back the securities so they can be replaced at some point. And you're actually responsible for dividends. All right, now imagine you're the shares of the original shareholder have been borrowed. That means in practice, in practice, that person does not actually own the shares anymore because they were borrowed and sold. That means they're not collecting any dividends. And who's on the hook for the dividends while the shares are being borrowed? You, the short seller. So you have to make payments for the dividends, and then the broker passes those payments on as dividends to the individual. So it's kind of interesting. It finally says there may be a small fee for borrowing the securities. Uh, again, it's a, uh, it's a they charge a borrowing fee. They say small fee. At various times, uh, I've been charged as much as 45%. So it's not always a small fee. For institutions, It's a relatively small fee and quoted as something called a hard to borrow rate, which I won't go into. I think I discussed in another class. Let me take one minute here. All right, Uh, sorry about that uh, pause. Uh, Again, I didn't want to disrupt the majority of the people who are going to watch this recording. But again, I do think there's some advantages for watching it live or close to live because I welcome, I absolutely welcome questions. Now, at this point, everybody might be too mystified to even think they can ask an intelligent question. And the fact is, given the tough of the materials, the toughness of the material, there really are no bad questions. So um, I really actually decided that the chat is distracting, even though that happens in one class when there's a lot of chatter here there probably won't be that many chats, so you can use the chat, but you can also ask the question verbally. I know that a lot of this is confusing. As I was finishing off saying, I was once asked to pay a 45% on the value of the borrowed shares as a lending fee, and so I had to close the position. Used to be my bread and butter way of making money would be short selling closed end funds, but then the institutions started to do the same thing, and now they get all the shares. And if I can get them at all, I frequently pay outrageous amounts. I've sort of given up, but it was highly profitable 
for like a 10 year period before the institutions got all over it. Again, not to make too much of this, you short 100 shares at 100, just so you see how it works. This is more appropriate for an investments class than a derivatives class, and close out the position three months later for $90. Now, of course, we're dealing with derivatives, so you have to apply this sort of to futures, uh, opening and closing positions in futures. But here they use a simple stock example, just so you see how short selling works in stock. During the three months, a dividend of $3 per share is paid. What is your profit? What is your loss? Well, let's just compute the profit on a per share basis. It looks like you made $10 on the short sale because you're selling it or short selling it at 100 and you're buying it back at 90. So it looks like that's $10. That's how a short sale works. Um, some people like to say buying short. There, there is no such thing as buying short. You're selling short. In the stock market, you're selling short. In the futures markets, you can sell to open. That's the closest thing I could think to buying short, sell to open, and it has nothing to do with the other. During the three months, though, a $3 dividend was paid, so you have to call up the $3. So what did you wind up making? You wind up making $7 a share. That's not either assume that's not including discounting if you were trying to bring it back to the present value or compounding to bring it to what the future value effectively is uh remember that uh that uh that uh i'm sorry um i'll just move on from that all right notation for valuing futures and forward contracts, some notation, which I'll try my best to keep consistent with, S0, F0, T, and R. All right, so very, very simple. Zero is the time period, meaning today. F0 is the future to forward price today. We haven't defined some later terms, though. T is the time until delivery, risk-free rate for maturity to time period T, is R. Now they give us an example here, and I'll take some seconds to do this. The spot price of a non-dividend paying stock is $40. The three month forward is 43. The three month US interest rate is five. Now it would be helpful if I had my 10 tablet, but again, this is pretty obvious. Later, I've given an arbitrage problem where I have put in contents and put in this presentation um, the writing out of the math. But the math here is pretty easy. Um, you basically should do $40 and there's no dividend. So it rises at E to the RT. E to the RT. Remember, one of the benefit of futures contracts is not having to tie your money up actually in the stock. If you do this math, you find, looking at my down, that that $40, okay, should yield a forward price of $40.50 approximately, $40.50. Yet the forward contract is trading at 43. So there's something wrong here. The forward contract's too expensive, trading at 43, or relative to at least the spot price is too low. I usually like to say that the, the forward price is higher than what it should be under an arbitrage opportunity. So you'll make a profit. What will you do? You will basically borrow again in arbitrage to show arbitrage is really a multiple purchases and sale of two or more securities that lost in a 
positive profit on zero net investment. Notice the zero net investment or to make it a really clean example, you should assume that the person did not lay down any cash themselves. So in the case of buying the non-dividend paying stock to take advantage of the arbitrage, you basically are going to borrow the $40. This just keeps the example clean. In fact, we'll see there's issues with borrowing versus lending rates not being the same. But again, let's just do the theory over here. So, uh, for instance, you may not be able to really borrow at, let's say, the current market rate of, but you definitely can, as a matter of fact, the current market rate of about 1% or less. But anyway, let's work out the math anyway. If you borrow $40, all right, that accumulates interest. In this example, it accumulates interest at 5% on a continuously compounded basis. And as we saw this number before, it happens to correspond. That is how much you're going to owe in three months. It grows to 4050. That's how much it's going to grow in um, three months. We're talking about the amount that you borrowed. So that's what we will be buying with borrowed money at the same time. It's the simultaneous buying and selling of two or more securities to lock in a risk-free profit on zero net investment. I know, a mouthful. That's the way I really like to say it when I say it in Joel speak. Um, so the three-month forward is overpriced. You'd be borrowing and buying the stock. You'd be selling the forward at 43. And three months from now, you would deliver the stock to satisfy the forward rate obligation. And what do you see over here? Well, when you get 43 for having delivered the stock and getting realizing your futures price, um, you only owe $40.50 to pay back your loan. So it's a two and a half dollar arbitrage profit. We, as I said, are going to look at a more difficult example where we're actually going to write it out. But for now, I'm just going to talk my way through these examples. Again, if I had a board and could easily utilize it, um, again, I haven't given up on the pen tablet, but I thought I could just write up some exhibits today to compensate for that. Um, in general, I'm going to talk my way through, but again, as I said, I'll give you an example. So let's move to the next one. Another arbitrage opportunity. This time, the forward is 39. This time, the forward is 39. The interest rate is 5%. The forward again is the same. It should be $40.50, but it's not. So what are you going to do? This is exactly the opposite. The forward is too cheap and you have an arbitrage opportunity. I remind you of an arbitrage opportunity because there are abundant stocks of stock, common stock available. There are abundant amounts. And so you either can short sell it, which we can take the simple example here, but as we'll see in a second, a lot of people own the stock anyway. And when they see a good opportunity, we'll take advantage of it. I used to work for a firm that did an amazing amount of what this essentially was when applied to entire stock market is called index arbitrage and they basically had all the tools to be able to sell stocks on a moment's notice because they owned it as part of their pension accounts and so the client would participate in the arbitrage fund which means that when there was an arbitrage opportunity they would capitalize on it and they would share the profit basically um, we got the management fee from doing it and they got the profit 
I don't think there was a more generous split for us than that. Um, so in this example, the forward is still supposed to be worth $40.50, but it's not. So in this case, you borrow and short sell the stock. And you put away the $40 into a bank. Now, again, this gets the issue. Can I really short sell a stock and make interest on the money? If you're a retail investor, no, unless you're maybe a huge retail investor. Institutions it frequently do get a little bit of interest rate, not the market rate, but a little bit of interest on the proceeds of the short sale. But let's assume, again, frictionless economy. But alternative, remember, some people own the stock anyway and will take advantage of the opportunity. So you basically short sell the stock, lend the money out. That grows to $40.50 after three months. At the same time you were doing it, it's simultaneous buying and selling of two or more securities. At the same time you were short selling, you were buying a forward contract for 39 so what do you do at the end? You pay 39 for the stock three months from now, and you've realized with interest $40.50 on the proceeds of the short sale. So you cover the stock, the short position with the stock you received in the forward, and you made about $1.50. Profit. Well, again, it's there's it's not like forty fifty. It's some little extra little bits, but so you're making approximately a dollar fifty. Of course, you wouldn't do this once. You do it over and over until the price discrepancy between what futures or, or forwards are trading at and what they should be trading at to prevent arbitrage that twain is met. So eventually you expect in a market there, it's so easy to arbitrage like this, that the futures or forward is going to equal the relationship as positive. All right, a forward price. This is just simply using this. It's showing the math that they just did. And so we've already talked about it, but now you have a overhead. I keep on going over what they call slide. You have slide eight to look at. And we've seen this map before. We covered it in the beginning. And again, we covered this. This is what the math looks like with the 0.05 interest rate and one quarter of a year. So it tells you the fair price of the futures. Again, we pretty much covered this. Short sales are not possible if it's an investment asset. This is the category they want to make, that they want to call something investment asset if it's basically um, readily available. Remember, that was the terminology I used on the arbitrage continuing. Um, it's basically abundant stocks. And it is therefore readily available for either short sale or for the party that already owns it to simply sell it. So formula still works for an investment asset because investors who hold the asset will sell it and buy forward contracts when the forward price is too low. When an investment asset provides a known income, there's a simple augmentation to this. Again, this might be a dividend in here would be an example of income we already saw with if there were a such thing, and I'm not aware of them, even though I heard once that they existed, forward contracts on stocks. Maybe you do that over the counter. It certainly doesn't trade as I know of on an exchange. And I have never saw it in the Wall Street Journal and financial publications. But remember, if that stock pays a dividend, all right, that's actually using the terminology and the thing that we used before is an advantage 
for the stock over the futures contract. If you own the futures contract, you do not collect the dividend. So remember, we said that if it's an additive process, all right, like the interest rate, it's a benefit to holding the futures. It winds up all other things constant, raising the futures price above the spot. But if it's a, something that is made available to the actual holder of the physical security, that means it actually is a disadvantage of futures relative to spot, and that will lead to a lower futures price. Now, when an investment asset provides a known yield, this is what we're generally going to deal with. It, it works pretty well for index arbitrage. Remember, we have already mentioned briefly index arbitrage using the S&P 500, for instance, on S&P 500 stocks. Okay, so you, there's a very active futures contract on the S&P 500, and the S&P 500 index is readily in owned it's readily available it's abundantly stocked there's plenty of people okay especially institutions that own the s p 500 in the precise capitalization weights as they exist in as i think i mentioned before occasionally they change the capitalization weights and that may make some people actually rebalance their portfolios but in general, the market weights are based on a market cap basis in determining the S&P 500. Compare that to the Dow index, which is a convoluted nightmare of weightings that have developed over history and therefore can't be undone without just keeping the equation going. So the Dow is a much more difficult index to replicate. There are ETFs that do a pretty good job of it. But again, they frequently have to rebalance. This especially happens in both indexes when one of the names is dropped and a new one is added. But this is, works really well in the S&P 500, looking at this as an investment asset. Stocks either don't pay dividends or pay them about four times a year, every three months. Because there's 500 different stocks in the S&P 500, there's a whole lot of dividends being paid at various times. And frequently, therefore, we estimate, okay, the known yield as a number here, as a continuously compounded rate. So a simple way of doing this as it relates to stocks would be that the R is the interest rate and the Q is the dividend yield. Instead of keeping track of a chunk of dividends that are going to be paid over, let's say, the three months or one year on 500 stocks, again, a sh shorter cut, which isn't too bad. Dividends are a little lumpy, but it's not too bad, is to use this as a continuously compounded dividend yield. Valuing a forward contract, and we sort of saw this already. Uh, I hope I'm not going through quick, too quickly through this. I will be spending plenty of time on some other things in the chapter, and I see we're running out of time. But valuing a forward contract, the key to remember, and we saw this before with the interest rate forward contracts, remember swapping, basically, in one case, they were uh, receiving 4% in a forward period of time on their uh, money uh, when they locked in the contract, but then that rate became 5.5, 5.0 and 5.5 respectively. I think they, they did it twice to show you increases with slightly different calculations. However, as that goes up or down the forward contract, the ability to have locked in the price as the value of that forward contract changes through time, the forward value, which was worth zero 
before can now take on positive or negative values. So that's important. So if you're locked in to buy the index at 500, which just keep the example very simple, and the index rallies, again, you're long the forward to some number way above 500. In futures markets, we see that right away by a positive marking to market. On a forward, there's no settlement until the end unless you make a reversing transaction, which can be hard to do. But you basically see that your forward is now worth, let's just say, approximately $50. Again, I'm not going to deal with those other components. But that means the forward price has gone up. It's now worth $550. You bought it for $500. So you've got a $50 approximate value to the forward contract. So again, now they're making some definitions. Suppose K is the delivery price and F0 is the forward price. So in this case, K again is the price you locked in. So if the forward price goes up, then it's worth the difference. And then we saw this. With our interest rates, you have to discount it back. You want to know what the present value is of that value of the loan because you don't realize that until the end, so you have to discount it back. And if it's the value of a short contract, you just reverse it. If it's a short contract, okay, you're locked in price relative to your F. If F goes down, then you make money, but again, you want to discount that back. Forward versus future prices, I don't want to spend more than three seconds on this, but um, there can be a difference, and it's related to the correlation, at least that's believed. This was a paper I once read before it was published back in the 1980s. Uh, I think I don't remember the full story. It was a very minor point, and you probably could find it in an appendix someplace, but uh, had something to do with systematic risk, I believe. But uh, a strong positive correlation, and you do not have to remember this, might result a uh, futures price that's slightly higher than the forward. Remember, futures are marked to market and forwards are not. Negative correlation would give the reverse. Um, just to tell you that there can technically be a difference between a forward and a futures price. The easiest way to compare is actually the futures for foreign exchange and the forward market for foreign exchange. You can see the difference between the two of them. I've never bothered to actually look. I'm sure it's minute. As I said before, the stock index can be viewed as an investment asset with this relationship here, where the Q is the average dividend yield. Already got to that. As it said, for the formula to be true, it's important that the index represent an investment asset. Now, again, I've got some issues with that. But they say, in other words, change in the index must correspond to change in a valuable, tradable portfolio. The key being tradable. Tradable. You have to be able to trade it, which means you have to, to make this perfect, um, have to be able to buy it as well as sell it and realize a proper value. The EK index is not some investment asset that can actually be replicated. It's called the NIK 225, and it's not, again, possible to replicate the weights of the NIK 225. That's usually not the index that, uh, let's say, retirement funds or people retiring, uh, saving for retirement, are using as their primary index for demarking NIK stocks. What they have, I believe, is a if I try to remember, this is a topics one and a topics two, if I remember. That's Japan. And we already saw this. When F is greater than it should be, again, index arbitrage, 
You buy the stocks and you sell the futures. In theory, to do it cleanly, you borrow to buy the stocks. And therefore, you have to pay the interest back. Again, that's all factored in. Another way to look at it is, um, again, the math that we kind of already went through with buying and selling, which we'll see a better example when I look at currency. But we saw a simple example with the stock. Um, when F is below it, you do the exact opposite. So it's really not a big deal. Not much to say. I, again, I will add that, um, as I said, the firm I once worked with, which is now owned by um, Blackstone Group, um, is it BlackRock or Blackstone? BlackRock is owned by BlackRock, um, was the largest index company in the world. It had pension assets, and uh, the huge investment was to be invested in the various index with the uh, S&P 500 being the most important one. Um, very often the computer is used to generate the trades when they find discrepancies. Um, and then again, this is a key, but we'll get on to the more important points. We all should just say you have to consider bid ass spreads. You are effectively, if you're, buy, if you're selling the futures and buying the spot, if you're selling the futures and buying the spot, if you're buying the spot, you have to worry about the ask prices. If you're selling the futures, you have to worry about the bid price. So you can't just use the last price, but that's a small technicality. Again, occasionally simultaneous trades, and this applies for all assets really are not possible. And there you're gonna depart from a no arbitrage relationship. Anyway, I thought I'd get a little uh, further. Um, I, I think I'll just point this, and you can know that we're going to finish on this. This is this is what we're going to have to, a whole heck of a lot to say about. So it's best we pick it up next time anyway. Um, it's talking about forwards and forwards and futures on foreign currency, of which you have a very interesting thing here of two different interest rates. And on this one, I'll go through a numerical arbitrage, which I've printed and is available in the content section. I made two things that say convexity one and two, and two arbitrage, arbitrage, uh, FX arbitrage one and two. I purposely did it twice in case it doesn't show up right viewed on the screen. And I think one of them does, I of the two. All right, uh, any questions? Again, I welcome emails, too, to ask questions. I do see that my meeting does end automatically if in three minutes. I'll have to bear that in mind in case I ever want to go over my morning. But this is certainly good for today. Uh, have a nice weekend.